In this video, I'm going to have a look at the Apogee control software, comparing it to some of the old features from the Apogee Maestro software. When you first install the Apogee control software, or when you start it up, you can go to File and Open Snapshot Template, and you'll be faced with some template choices. Now, Apogee are trying to make things simple, which is great. But the problem I personally find with templates of any kind, whether it's a spreadsheet template, a Pro Tools template, or any other kind of digital audio workstation template, is that you're very much at the mercy of the person who made it. And what I mean by that is someone who's made the template has done so with the relevant know-how and experience, has physically set up those connections, and has physically made the, the connection in their head uh, and made those those kind of memory points or milestone points so if they want to recall through their memory the actions that they took to be able to make something happen they can quite easily do so because they've already had the the practice and procedure through setting up the template itself um, for us looking at a template that somebody else has created for the first time we've got no practical experience in actually creating that template. And the assumption is that once you open up the template, it's going to work to your specific purpose straight out the box. I'm not saying that these templates don't do that. It probably depends on what your specific purpose is. And unfortunately, you're just going to have to do a little bit of trial and error, see if they do work for your purpose, or if you would like to just get in about it, jump in with both feet, learn a bit about how routing and audio works and software control and hardware and all that kind of stuff. Use the full functionality and customize it to your own personal experience and create your own template. So I'm not 100% sold on how useful these will be to you in the long term. They're great for quick fixes. I just don't think they're great as learning devices. So based on that, we're going to click on the full functionality template. We want unrestricted access to everything and we'll decide what we want and what we don't want. So once you first open the full functionality template, I don't know about you, my first impression is that it's a very busy interface, certainly when you compare it to the Maestro software. This is probably just a bit of a shell shock moment for me than anything else and I'm sure that I'm going to get over it. The second thing that I'll say about the new software is that I've had to pump up the brightness on my screen. I'm using a MacBook Pro, about 2014 edition, and I've had to put the brightness up to about 80%. Personally, I find my eyes quite sensitive to the screen brightness, especially when there's lots of whites on the screen. Generally, I work with the brightness level down at about 15, 20% at all times. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how much I had to turn the brightness up to gain a full appreciation for the new software look. The problem with that is that as soon as you bring anything up on the screen that has bright whites, like a, a blank Word document or the essentially the Google page, um, the, the brightness of the whites can be quite overwhelming. If we had a, a user interface option to customise the contrast or the base colour scheme of the software, that would have been ideal to tailor the software to our own requirements and our own sensitivities and preferences. But we don't have that, so let's work with what we've got. The first thing you can do is start to try and trim it down um, and you can do that by clicking on the channel view on the mix window and you can do that by deselecting any channels you know that you won't or don't use. In this example we're going to deselect the ADAT channels 9 through to 16 because we only use ADAT channels 1 to 8. The next thing you can do is trim it down further by deselecting the other two mixers and the effects mixer if you know that you're not going to use them. You can also deselect the visibility of the device section. Once you've got your output format set, which shouldn't take you too long, uh, or if you know that it's not likely to change at all, you can just simply deselect the visibility of that. If you do want to change it, as long as you know where the button is to get visibility of that again, just simply click on the device button and it's right there. You can also do the same with the system settings, but we prefer to keep them visible. It can sometimes come in handy if you're ever doing a bit of on-the-fly troubleshooting. So taking a look at the input section, 
all the physical inputs of your ensemble can be controlled at the top of the mix window. Alternatively, you can access the physical input controls by clicking on the Essentials button on the top left and it's the third button in. I quite like the layout and the idea of the Essentials detached menu. I'd say that the only downside is that it's so super condensed that the input options are completely anonymous. Even a wee 4.8 for phantom power or SL for soft limit or just a simple G for group, uh, anything at all for a, a step for a hint would be fantastic instead of blank boxes that only a mass amount of experience in using this um, would mean that you would know where to go. And I do realise that anything like that would have been super tiny and that's probably why the developers chose not to put the signs on the boxes and only those of you that have got eyes like an eagle would have been able to identify the signs but anything at all would have been better than nothing. The good thing is at least you can still do everything that you did do in the Maestro with this new Apogee control software. Nothing seems to have been taken away. I would also direct you once again to check out the Sound on Sound article, Decibels Explained. It does go into detail about the purpose and principle behind the DBU and DBV values. Put simply, DBV is for semi-pro equipment and DBU is for pro equipment. Please check it out. Then go into your physical outputs. The same rules apply. DBU, DBV, go to Sound on Sound. Check out the Decibels Explained article, don't take my word for it, do your research. You do still have the option to trim the output levels. In the Maestro, these were shown as faders, if you chose to show them. Here, in the Apogee control software, they display themselves as little circles, wee circle dials, whatever you want to call them. Each output can be trimmed by 12 dB. Personally, I would have liked the option to retain a button to hide the trims. I don't find much use for them myself, so if I could get rid of them, that would have been fantastic, but unfortunately, we've, we're stuck with them. You might also notice that the reset trims button is gone. It's not that I found myself messing around with the trims on Maestro at all, but it was good to know that the option was always there. We've still got all our guitar outputs for reamping, and you can still choose to go directly through the device in live or take a DI guitar signal from your DAW. We still have the hardware set up to assign button C and we can just do this at ease, just pressing that on the actual physical hardware itself. Uh, so we press button C and it changes it from through to software and from software back to through, depending on what our preference is. You can still change your assignable buttons by clicking the fourth button on the left hand side and this used to be accessible through the device settings tab on the Maestro software. You can change the assignments at any time. So if you want different options in the studio when you're mixing compared to when you're in a live recording situation, you can totally do that. For example, if you're in the studio, you might have multiple monitor sets. You can choose your assignable button D, for example, to be able to toggle between your monitor one set and your monitor two set. Then when you go through to the live setting, you can change that option to something like make all your outputs mono or something like that. On your monitor and headphone outputs, you've still got exactly the same controls to sum to mono, dim the volume and mute the outputs, just as you did in the Maestro software. You've still got your clear meters button. That's moved up to the top right hand side. It used to be housed on the left hand side on Maestro. We're now over to the right hand side on the Apogee control software. And along with clear meters, you also have a button for top back, mute all, and you've got some hover help as well. So just going back to the top back button for a second, pushing that in just simply enables the top back mic for the duration that the button has been pressed. You can choose your top back source on the far left hand side of the screen. You can assign where the top back audio should be routed to. In the Maestro software, you used to be able to assign the top back mic to multiple outputs, like headphone one and headphone two. And you could independently switch them on and off. 
So you could have headphone one off while keeping headphone two on or assign it to both at the click of a button, which is important. The fewer clicks, the better the user journey. Now in the new software, you could probably set it up to act in the same way that I'm talking about, but I'd feel like it would take a bit more faffing around with the mixer settings and it just doesn't seem to be available in the same amount of clicks as what it previously was in the Maestro software, which is a bit of a shame. You also used to be able to use one of the Ensemble's physical inputs as a talkback. So in the Maestro software, this was input channel 8. In the new Apple G control software, you simply don't have that option at all. And again, that's disappointing that we're getting functionality taken away from us. Personally, I never used the option to um, use physical input 8 as a talkback but it was good to know that the flexibility was there. Going back to the mute all button, there's not much really to say about this button other than when you click it, it mutes all the physical outputs. The disappointing thing I would say about this button is that when you click it again, it doesn't unmute them all, so you need to individually unmute the headphone one, two and main outputs. Then we have hover help, which is a new feature for Apogee and um, yeah, I think that's a great addition especially when you're getting used to audio hardware device control software for the first time hover help will attempt to explain about almost anything you see in front of your face so yeah click on that move the mouse around the screen really read the the descriptions that it's given you and uh, try and digest and ask yourself questions about what that actually means seek clarity from yourself and from the description and if you feel like you're still not getting that uh, always drop me a message, I'll do my best to try and break it down for you. Um, search for other YouTube videos. Um, if you're at university, ask your lecturer for a further breakdown. Or just go to Apogee support and just be like, oh, your uh, hover help doesn't help me, so can you please explain? Um, and that that's really the only way that we can get continuous improvement through these bits of software is if we tell these people that it either uh, that it is or isn't suiting our needs really and that user feedback you would hope would drive better software in the long run. Now the basic Ensemble device information is held on the far left hand side and it's broken into uh, system and device. Now in the system section you've got uh, what the master device is. Now I believe that's where you've got multiple devices together which I don't, I've only got one um, Apogee Ensemble Thunderbolt device. Um, but if you had two, then you would have to choose which one is going to be the master device. Um, I'm assuming for clocking purposes and sample rate purposes. So yeah, you've got uh, your master device, you've then got your clock source, sample rate, peak hold, and that's still set at uh, two seconds infinite or nothing at all, your overhold which has the same values as your peaks. The overs default to infinite and your peaks default to two seconds. It's your own personal preference what you want to change that to, if anything. Then you've got keyboard volume. This was also present in the old Maestro software. Um, we've got ours set to headphone one. So whenever we hit the B headphone buttons on the MacBook Pro, the headphone volume raises and lowers. We don't have to reach over to the device itself or anything within the control software to actually make the volume of the headphones go up or down, which is a nice wee feature. Then you've got your top back source and your top back uh, destination. Within the device section, you've got the ensemble itself. You've got your main output format. And that's where you can choose what kind of speaker setup you've got, whether it's a simple stereo speaker setup, a two speaker setup, a three speaker setup, or any of the surround sound setups like 5.1 or 9.1 or anything like that. In the old Ma Maestro software, I believe only catered for 5.1 solutions. So seeing 9.1 in this looks like it's pretty good for um, future compatibility of extended systems. It's probably worth mentioning that you can't set the volume depending on the speaker that you're listening to. It's the same volume. If you've got the volume at minus 20 dB, 
that volume will remain the same regardless as to what speaker set you're listening to, whether it's speaker set one, two or three, um, the volume will always be the master volume of whatever you've set it at. In the example that I was talking about, minus 20 dB. And then lastly in the device section, you've got optical one format and optical two format, and the options are simply ADA or uh, SPDIF. Now in the old Maestro software, you had a section called input routing, and basically that entire section has been removed. Um, in the last video that I did, looking at the Maestro software, I couldn't think of any practical use for changing the default input routing. Uh, therefore, I guess its removal would seem fair enough. Um, if you did use it yourself, you might be disheartened to discover that it has been decommissioned. As for the output routing section, uh, that is still present, albeit in a different layout compared to the old Maestro software. Personally, I did like the old grid layout and especially the marking of software outputs in comparison to actual physical outputs. I feel like that was a real welcome sign on the, the Maestro software and it made it clear to me what I was dealing with and how that related to what my, my DAW would see. And this is something that is uh, lacking, I feel, in the, the current Apogee control software that we're looking at today. All you have now is a choice of routing to playback, mixers, hardware inputs, as I get into the gubbins of all this and get to use it, I'll do my best to post an update and do my best to try and explain it to you. There's definitely a lot of improvements on in all this, but there's something in this section that is a bit mystifying and not very transparent, shall we say. And lastly, I'll draw your attention to the, the mix window. Um, on the mix window, the physical input metering is now clearly separated away from the faders. And this is a welcome change as previously in the Maestro software. It might have seemed confusing to some if you had meter readings that remained unchanged despite any sort of fader setting that you chose. So if you brought your fader right down, your physical input wouldn't change because that's pre-fader. And unless you kind of knew about the difference between pre-fader and post-fader and and unless you knew where those meter readings sat for the Apogee, you might be looking at that and getting confused. So I feel like that's an improvement, clear separation, um, and hopefully that makes things clearer for you. So yeah, that's a comparison between the new Apogee control software uh, against the old Apogee Maestro software. Hopefully you found it useful. Hopefully in going through some of these screens, you can see where the differences are. Lastly, I'll just show you this spreadsheet which I've um, created. It attempts to list all the functionality that I could find in the old Maestro software. I've tried to map out the location of that function within the old software in Maestro. I then tried to identify where it might have changed. So for example, headphone to some to mono functionality that was previously in the Maestro output tab. In the new software, it's always visible on the right hand side of the screen and it's the, the Wii Eureka type icon on the right hand side and that's that's present for headphone 1, headphone 2 and your main outputs. You can sum those outputs to mono. They are always visible and you don't have to go to the output tab or the mixing tab to actually use that. So that's an example of one of the differences. Hopefully you find this spreadsheet useful. Feel free to take a screenshot, feel free to print it out, feel free to copy it, add to it, try and make it better, share it around. If you find it useful, let me know. So yeah, go forth, enjoy.